Welcome back. It is Friday and that means FNA Friday. And today I'm going to talk about how to block out your animation. I know, I don't know. Your blocking is wrong. It's absolute clickbait title. But hear me out. I want to talk about blocking, the process of blocking, how to show blocking, mostly in relationship to student work. Because I've been teaching for 11 years, and there's a certain pattern that I see in how students present their first pass, their blocking pass, and how that can cause problems in the long term, and that will kind of set them back, and it will take so much more time to get the work done. So today is going to be a part one about what not to do, a bit more theory and a bit more of my opinions. <laughs> and then I'm gonna continue with more examples and this is gonna segue into workflow and then back into blocking. So as I'm attacking my second block of animation tips for FNA, this is gonna be a bit more back and forth with hands-on demos and examples and theory. And I think blocking is massively important because there's something about poses and all that good stuff. But the thing is, if your blocking is structurally not where it's supposed to be in terms of showing information, showing the story points or the acting points or the emotions or whatever you have, then you're going to have such a harder time to fix it later on. Your main structure, your basis for your work has to be absolutely clean, even as a student. It's super important as you work for your clients and everything, but as a student already, you gotta get into the habit of making your blocking work correctly. And by correctly, I mean this. Blocking doesn't mean crappy animation. Ooh, I know, this is, this is, how dare you? I know, I know. Now, let me rephrase. Blocking doesn't mean super rough animation. That's probably one of the most common things that I see from student work is that when I give the assignment and then next week blocking is due, but what I give back a lot of times, not most of the times, but a lot of times, it's technically a layout pass where you have the basic camera, maybe a set, the staging, and some really rough animation of a character moving from left to right, doing maybe some acting choices, and then that's kind of it. And that is A, really, really difficult to critique because it's so rough. There is not enough information in terms of the story, the acting points, the emotions, your, your gear change, or whatever you want to do in there, or even if you do a weight assignment to show the weight and the complexities and all that good stuff. So that's already a problem. Even if they show something that's more advanced than layout, it's still not quite there in terms of really showing every beat, the story points, and clear information. So what do I mean by that? To me, subjectively, but still, blocking means every story point, every idea, every emotional beat, every choice that the character makes and that you want to show to the audience has to be as clear as possible. And here's the controversial thing. Blocking can also include polished animation. I know. What? I know, no, no, hear me out. My point is that if you have a specific move that needs more advanced animation to sell that point, then that's what you need to do. If you can show exactly what you want to portray in terms of, again, your acting choice, whatever it is, with minimal keys and it's still clear, that's even better because you're going to be faster. Revisions can be incorporated faster. That's obviously better. But if you need to set more keys and be more detailed and have more advanced animation, because that's what you need to do to show that story point, then that's what you have to do. Obviously, you don't want to polish during blocking, because then you're going to put too much time into this and there are potential changes coming in and then your workflow is going to slow down for sure. But I prefer to go full on the opposite way and say, if you need to really polish something to sell an idea that's better than just keep it in layout and then have people be confused when they look at your work. So as an example, for instance, if you have, and my thing is always head turns, right? So if you have a character that looks at another character and it's kind of a suspicious type of look and you just do this, and that turn away. The moment of looking, maybe some eye darts, like, hmm, a little bit of a pause, and then, and then over. That is totally different than if you do this. But that's what I mean with layout style or really, really rough blocking. If you just have two keys and you have this, what does that mean? Does the character not care? Or is the character sleepy? Or is it a robot? It's like, this can mean so many things. But if I do this, that has a completely different meaning. And if you need to set more keys to sell that, then so be it. Obviously, with more experience and the more work that you do, and you know, you're adapting different workflows where you can sell that idea with minimal keys and some tweaks in your graph editor, obviously that's the ideal thing because you'll be faster, but you still tell the story. But again, going back, the main problem that I see with student work is that their blocking is so rough. It's almost layout style that the ideas are not there, but they consider that blocking. So then 
then when the next pass comes in, which should be blocking plus, where you put in all your notes and kind of refine your animation towards you know the final stages, then suddenly a gesture like this turns into something like that, where the idea is completely different. And that's my whole point. All of your ideas, all of your acting choices, the timing, especially the timing, has to be clear in your blocking pass. If you need examples, you can easily type in progression reel, or there's an example of a, an artist on Instagram that constantly shows his work at Disney. And if you look at blocking pass, what they consider blocking, and this is all in step mode, and sometimes it's not step mode, but a lot of times it's step mode, you can see how much detail is already there in head turns, head accents, shoulder movements, just the general timing. Why? Because it shows the intention, it shows the timing, it shows the emotion, it shows all the acting choices and they're clear. Especially if you work for someone and if you want to show it to your lead, your super client or whatever it is, you have to make sure that every story point is clear. If then someone asks, I don't understand what this means, then you technically failed because you didn't put in enough information to make that story point clear. Now, I totally understand as a student, as you're still learning animation, you got to worry about arcs and, and pops and spacing and everything, that it's a lot to ask to not only be good from a technical point of view, but then on top of that, also put all of your animation. But at the same time, I don't think it's encouraged enough. Just looking at other people's work from other classes, maybe other, you know, semesters, previous semesters where this is considered okay, this is considered blocking or later or looking at the grades that they get. I don't think it's hammered in enough that you need to go further in your blocking pass. But in order to do that, in order to have all the information ready in terms of the timing and everything I said, you also need to have a good foundation. You need to have a plan. Damn it, Valentine, you never plan ahead. Plan ahead. Plan. Okay, here's the plan. That is the plan. Which is also super important and I highly encourage that. It's better that you sit around for days doing nothing or you just think about your animation, where you shoot reference, you thumbnail, you just plan things out, that you want the clearest idea possible for your shot. Once you have that in your head or paper or you know reference, whatever you have, then you can attack your shot and you know exactly which beat and you can concentrate on is this idea, this story point, this emotion or whatever I want to portray coming across correctly and in the best fashion so that everybody understands that. But if your plan is too rough or you have no plan at all, you just start animating without any type of, you know, planning beforehand, then you're going to have such a harder time and then your blocking is going to be all muddled and not clear. You're kind of hesitating in the choices and just your whole process is going to be so much longer and more difficult for you. And going further than that, if you look at what people consider polish, the thing is, imagine you have a car, any car. This is always my, my favorite example. I don't know if it's a stupid example, but my example for the students is that imagine a car. Let's take a full Volkswagen, whatever, right? And it's completely dirty. But that's your car, it's just really, really dirty. And then polish is the same car, but just clean. It's the same idea, it's the same make, same model, the same design, everything. It's just you, you took the dirt away, right? But for a lot of people, this might be exaggeration, but for a lot of students that I see, polish for them is like you have a Volkswagen that's dirty, and then you have Mercedes that's dirty. <laughs> totally different cars, a totally different idea, but it's still kind of dirty where they don't look at, well, technically you got to get to blocking plus where you're pretty much done and polish is basically asymmetry. So, you know, like fine tuning of timing stuff in the fingers, in the face, but it's not that much different than your blocking plus pass. But I think the common misconception, there are two of them, like I said, is that blocking means very rough animation and that from whatever stage you're at, say, let's say blocking plus for just speaking of a term, from blocking plus to polish is a huge difference. Not really, it really should just be the final polish, which takes a lot of time because it's, you know, all the detail you want to put in, but it really shouldn't be a dramatic difference. So again, if you need to polish your shot for blocking, then so be it. Is it ideal? Of course not. Should you do this? No, you need to be as fast as you can and as clean and as simple while still showing all of the information. But this comes with experience and practice. But still, when you present a shot for blocking, make sure that every idea is clear. Now, one of the pitfalls and one of the reasons why it looks so rough is because a lot of students do stepped mode for animation. Now, I love step. Step is fine, right? In terms of posing, because it really forces you to think about this is the pose, now this is the pose, and this is the pose, and you're gonna look at is that pose clear? Is the silhouette okay? And does it tell the story? That's fine. But the danger is that you just set a couple keys in stepped, 
And because it's stepped, it kind of looks better because you kind of pop from pose to pose and it kind of looks cool and that's it. And the moment you spline this, so many students freak out because then it turns into this spliny mess. Why? Because you didn't set enough breakdowns and in-betweens, you didn't take enough control over the timing. And that's my biggest complaint and hesitation when I say to Zoom, you should do stepped mode. Only because it just takes so much work and discipline to do stepped, spline, go back, add more breakdowns, spline it again, need more breakdowns, and not a lot of, maybe that's too harsh, it doesn't mean that not a lot of students do that, but it's something that is very common. Like common enough for me to make this clip and say this. So for instance, and that this came up yesterday in class, when you have someone that sits, and this is your pose in your stepped key process, right? And then the next pose is the, is the character standing. That's not gonna work. How you get up, if it's a quick one, if it's, and I say this you know, in previous definitions, if you watch this, if it's like a slow uh, getting up, if it's an alert thing, whatever it is, there's so much information that you can show between the sitting and the standing pose. Same with the head like this and the head here, how do you get there? And in order to show that through your steps, A, you have to have more breakdowns and in-betweens and you correct ease ins and outs, but it also goes back to you gotta have a plan. All right, here's the plan. What's the plan? Runner's not a plan. Now runner's what you do when the plan fails. And you need to know why you're doing this and you need to know what your character is supposed to do and what you want to show to the audience. So it's really a multi-step thing, but before you start anything, you gotta have a clear idea. You gotta have a plan. Then you gotta have a clear representation of that idea, be it just in your head, because I can't draw, so it's mostly in my head, or reference, or thumbnails. But once you have that plan, Here's the plan. Then you attack that plan with clear blocking. And again, if you need to set more keys to make that blocking clear, then so be it. And just practice to set less keys to be faster and then you can make more changes. But again, the biggest thing is that blocking doesn't mean rough animation. Blocking means every idea is presented in the clearest fashion for whoever watches this. Now, that being said, your blocking can be rough if you're showing it to someone who has seen your final animation, who knows how you polish. And this is sometimes easier at work when you show something really rough and you show it to your lead or your coworker and you say, listen, this is kind of my idea. They don't have to go, well, this is really rough. I don't know if you can actually polish this. Because that's one of the concerns as, as a teacher is that when you see work from students and it's rough and the ideas are kind of there, like I don't know, especially if it's a new students and it's not a repeat students, I don't know how fast they work. I don't know how, you know, I mean, I can look at the previous reel, but you never quite know how long it took them. So it's kind of a thing of, this looks cool, but this might take you two months to finish. I don't know if it's gonna take you two months or three weeks, I'm not sure. So that's why you wanna encourage your students to keep things simple so they have enough time to go through the whole process and polish and so on and so on. My point is, at work, you know people's work. You've seen your coworkers' final shots. You know what they can do with something. So I would say at work, it's a bit easier to show internally rough work because they know, well, I know that this person can take this so much further and I can I can see the ideas there and I can say, okay, well, that's a good idea. I'm not sure about that. Follow this and pursue that and, and you know, flesh that out. But you can show something super rough and not clear to a client. And again, I can't walk, talk too much about work because, you know, permissions and blah, blah, blah. But it's not uncommon to show blocking plus to clients because A, it has to work with a life action plate, which is, you know, full motion and real time and everything. And your animation has to kind of fit that. So if you do super rough, step blocking, something that pops in front of a live action plate, a bit of a problem. But mainly, again, you wanna show things as clearly as you can. And sometimes you also just wanna sell it. You just wanna make a good impression. You're like, this is cool, This I wanna sell the shot. Which also means that sometimes you gotta go further than blocking and maybe it's blocking plus, and maybe that's not what the client wanted and you gotta delete the whole thing and start from scratch. And that's okay, because that's the job. Your job is to just present something in the clearest fashion and have it be kick ass so that the client likes it and then you move on. It, it's not about, I mean, Hopefully it can be economical because of money issues and budget and time and so on, but that's a whole different FNA. So at work, it's okay to be rougher because people know how you work and they've seen your final work. At school, it's different. So if a student shows me very, very rough blocking, it's usually an indication that it's gonna take a long time to get there and the revisions are gonna be tricky. And it also depends how the student takes in the notes, do they understand the notes in terms of, oh, I gotta do this. And then they absorb the notes so that the next pass already has those notes in mind for the next critique and so on and so on. So you gotta be very careful what you tell the students. And the thing is for me, the biggest thing as always is just keep things short and simple enough so you can go through the whole process. And you can practice to go through blocking to polish and so on and so on and then just have the muscle memory of doing that. So what could you do to practice that? Like one of the things you could do that I mentioned yesterday in class, it's kind of a tricky thing and it's not it's not long term and it's not something that you can use for your reel. But what you could do is, again, look for progression reels. Look at, there's so many reels out there where people show their layouts, their blocking, maybe already polished, maybe they're skipping blocking plus, but they show their final animation 
animation than file animation rendered. But a lot of times you see blocking, a lot of times it's stepped, and you can see the amount of detail that's in there. If you can find something that is stepped, maybe a bit more on the rougher side, not super detailed, what you could do technically, take that footage into Maya, take any rig that you have that somewhat matches that rig, right? And then rotoscope, I know it's horrible to say, but rotoscope the step poses. Not because that's what you want to present or keep, but you can have that pose and then look at when does it pop into the next pose and then copy that, copy that. And then you look at the curves. Because to me, it's also important that you look at, this is the animation, well, what does that look like in the graph editor? I, my process has been, again, it's very subjective, is as I go through my, my work and as I practice and as I see other people's work when you take someone else's shot to fix it or change something, or if I see mocap and I see the mocap curves, I learn from seeing the curves. I know that, well, if this curve looks like this, I know that this is gonna do this to the animation. So sometimes you can tweak the graph editor, the curves in the graph editor, and you know what the result is going to be, and sometimes you make this change, you know that how it's gonna affect the curve, and so on and so on, it's back and forth. So to me, there's a lot of value at looking at curves to see what that means. So if you have some rough blocking in terms of steps that still shows every idea, it might be beneficial to bring that in, do the poses, and look at, well, how, how does that affect the timing? What are the curves? Because you don't wanna get caught up into cleaning your curves. A lot of times people do, again, I'm saying a lot of times, I'm exaggerating, but you might have an animation and it's okay, and then you start cleaning the graph editor because for some reason someone told you that your curves have to be clean. I don't know, not to me, not really. I mean, it's your animation looks good and your curves are super messy and it's not cheated and it doesn't destroy things downstream like sim or hair or cloth, then it's fine. If it looks great, it looks great. But sometimes if you go back in there and you clean your curves, you start to kind of file down and sand down the accents, the nice little moments where everything gets kind of too clean and then it loses that edge. It just becomes all kind of swimmy and spliny and kind of eh. And I think one of the benefits would be to see something that's well animated and see what the curves are doing. Now, it's hard to get someone professional shot and then get that Maya scene and look at the curves. But again, maybe one of the ways could be that you look at something that's you know, not super, super detailed in step mode, but just rough enough that it's clear enough and cool, put that into Maya, copy it so that you can see what happens between each poses, what the curves do. This might be time consuming. I'm not saying do this all the time, but this could be a way for you to understand something. Like my point is also, you have to find different ways of learning. You got to ad adopt different workflows and different methods. Because there's not one workflow that's going to work for everybody. So maybe that might be a step for you to where something clicks and you understand the process better and so on and so on. I mean, I don't know, again, try different things. But as a whole, that's my rant. Now, I'm gonna show more example. Part two is gonna be more of a, it's still blocking related, but it dips into workflow. What can you do to make sure that your blocking is good, that your timing is still there, that your what you blocked out kind of resembles your reference or what you had in mind? There are a couple steps, kind of like a hit list that I tell my students that they should pay attention to in order to make their blocking work. But still, the main thing that I wanted to communicate in this first clip, in this part one, is that rough animation is not blocking. That it's basically layouts. You gotta flesh this out more. I have more acting beats. This is a bit too even. Like the, the body might just do a turn like this. I don't know what that means. Is that because the character is really stressed out and stiff? Or is it because he didn't set enough keys? And then you ask specific acting questions and then they don't know. Well, I don't know what I wanted to do here. Which then goes back to planning. So the big thing is gotta have a plan. Looks to me like they're coming up with a plan. I have to change that plan. We've got a plan. And you gotta have a clear plan in however way you get there. Again, thumbnails, reference, whatever you need. Then with that clear plan, you attack your blocking. And your blocking has to present every idea that you have and every acting choice in the clearest fashion. So whatever you can do to minimize the steps so that your workflow gets faster, this is super important. This is another thing about workflow and being fast at work. That's a whole different FNA, but it's okay for blocking to have advanced animation in there as long as every idea is presented in the clearest fashion. And sometimes I think, is that really too exaggerated? And then I look at those examples and I go, no, their blocking pass is pretty advanced. I mean, it's still in step mode, but there's so much information, how shoulders can move or the head moves. I think it's a good thing to strive towards. I know it, again, this is difficult to do as a student because you have so much to learn still, but it, this should be on your horizon. This should be your end goal that when I block something out, I'm gonna put in as much information as I can. Doesn't mean again that you need to do like crazy offsets and you know and your fingers and everything. It, of course, there are things you will simplify, but the current danger is that you simplify too much. And one of the ways to to make that mistake is to do step mode and just have your golden poses and that's it. So for anybody, any student that does step mode blocking, make sure that you put in enough breakdowns and in-betweens and you take control of those ease-ins and outs and how your character goes from pose to pose, what body part leads, so that every intention is clear, okay? I think I've beaten that horse to death. <laughs> 
But I will explain that again and I will repeat that again in future FNAs because it's a really, really important thing that your basic structure, your main thing that you start with animation is as solid as you can. Otherwise, it's going to take forever to fix it. And again, your workflow will suffer and so on and so on. Next week, part two, there are more examples. There are again, workflow tips. It's gonna be a bit of a back and forth between workflow and just blocking theory, but that's it. If you have concerns about anything I just said, like, wait a minute, but that makes any sense. Please comment, let me know, because I think this part, the, the step of blocking things out is so important. So if you have tips or other examples or anything that you use that you wanna share that other people can see and learn from it, it would be awesome to comment and share that. If this was, as always, helpful, like and subscribe. Oh, my whole thing, you know how it goes. And it's obviously helpful to me. And I will continue next week with more info about blocking with potentially less clickbaity titles. Maybe, or I'll keep the title and just say part two. All right, so thank you for watching and I will see you next week.